In this week's In-Ear Insights, let's talk about what salary should you ask for? This is a question that uh, came up in the previous uh, So What episodes. If you want to check out that out on the YouTube channel. But let's, let's dig into how do we even know what kind of salary to ask for. So Katie, on the show, do you want to recap what you and John had talked about uh, in terms of where, where you'd started to think about compensation? Yeah. So the, uh, so what episode, Chris, that you're referencing, John and I did um, last week, which was the 17th of, of uh, November. If you're looking for that specific episode, it was, you know, <clears throat> how to determine red flags for, from a potential employer and one of the things that came up was if they're not willing to discuss uh, the salary range with you. Like, so if you're talking with the hiring manager and they said, well, I'm not authorized to discuss salary with you, or I can't tell you what other people at your level are making uh, competitively, then that's a huge red flag because I hate the term in this day and age, but in this day and age, salary is no longer as uh, taboo or confidential um, it's pretty wide open in terms of, it's pretty transparent in terms of like, here's what I make, here's what you should be making. And there's really no rules around when it can and cannot be discussed anymore. You know, I feel like it's a very outdated and antiquated, you know, mindset of, well, we can't talk about salary because that's just very personal. And to be fair, some of it is like, you don't have to share what you're making if you're not comfortable, but in terms of negotiation with a you know potential employer, you absolutely should be having those conversations. Exactly. And um, as of January 1, this coming year, uh, employers in California and New York no longer have a choice. It'll be mandatory. Salary, salaries must be published as part of job descriptions. Which is weird to me that they don't currently publish that information in general because you would think that you would either attract or, you know, not attract more candidates based on those salary requirements. And so, you know, it, you would imagine that it would be beneficial for a hiring manager to say, this is the salary range. And so that way they wouldn't be inundated with thousands of resumes of people thinking that it's much, much higher than it is, or they have people who are more qualified to go, yep, okay, I can do that. So I was at a conference last week, the uh, Society for Marketing Professional Services, and one of the speakers, uh, Kat, was just before me, was talking about the chaos that that can cause in an organization because the published salary range may be substantially higher than the people who are currently employed in that mm -hmm. job. And uh, they were saying at one point that an employer said, well, we can't publish salary ranges or we'll have to true up our salaries to, to the published ranges. And and Kat said, well, your choices are either you can pay the million dollars to true up to, you know, to bring everyone to the levels of published, or you can spend the $20 million it's going to cost you to rehire everybody mm -hmm. when they all quit. Uh <laughs> I, so I can speak to a real story. Um, so obviously a lot of uh, hourly positions uh, in the service industry are struggling to hire. And so they keep upping the uh, minimum salary to like $15 an hour, $16 an hour, $20 an hour. And honestly, it varies, you know, town by town, store by store. And so I've mentioned before that my husband works in a very large grocery chain and he's been there for gosh, 15 years. And they, the chain in general is struggling to hire. So they keep upping the starting salary. Well, they have no plans to true up the other people's salaries. So people who are just walking through the door are going to make, be making close, if not more than people like my husband who have been there for 15 years and it is pissing people off left and right. And then, so you'll be losing that experience and that institutional knowledge of people who are willing to put up with your bullshit basically for these brand new people who are just going to last three months and then go move on to the next door. That's going to pay them another dollar more an hour. Exactly. So it is, it is going to cause chaos if it's not handled correctly. Exactly. And that's what's, the, the what, part of what causes the revolving door. We saw this when we worked at the PR agency. People would, instead of getting the three or four percent raise from you, you just quit and get a twenty percent raise and a and a title change by flipping to the next agency. So they, mm -hmm. they, there were people who did that about eight, every eighteen months, and mm -hmm. 
made vice president, you know, in half the time because they just kept job hopping from position to position. Now, whether they were actually any good at their job is a separate. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It honestly, it almost doesn't matter because hmm. when these companies are faced with that constant revolving door, they're just looking for any warm body to fill that seat that's good enough, that is competent enough until whoever is taking that role decides to move on again because they didn't get the money they needed. Um, you know, and while it's costly for companies to shore up, it's also exhausting for job seekers to be constantly switching jobs unless you thrive in that kind of uncertainty and chaos. And some people quite honestly do, and that's fine. I, uh, as evidenced by how long I stay at jobs, do not. And so, but that's also hurt me in terms of being able to demand a higher salary from previous employers. Exactly. So let's dig into this exercise. This is something that I used to do when I was a recruiter, because I was a recruiter for uh, about a year. I did very badly at it. I was going to um, say, that scares me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's all those whole lot of those stories for another episode. Oh, yes. Um, well, I mean, just the, the, the very brief summary is the reason I was bad at this is because recruiting is the only sales job where the product can unsell itself. Um, meaning the candidate can go into a job uh, and and do so badly that even though you've done your job as a recruiter and trying to match the right person for the right job, the candidate goes in there and and and, and doesn't do as well. But that's that is indeed uh, another uh, another story for another time. Let's go through uh, the first thing we want to do is there's two kinds of salary assessments you want to do. There's internal and external. So let's start with the uh, the internal salary assessment. I'm going to go ahead and share a Chrome tab here. And this is something that should not be a surprise to anyone. Um, this is a, you know, a standard spreadsheet. The first thing we want to do is just to make a list of, of our monthly expenses. So say your rent is $2,500 a month, uh, you spend $500, $500 on food, you spend $300 on utilities, although maybe it's more than that these days. You've got your $100 worth of Netflix and Hulu and whatever. Um, you try to put aside maybe $150 a month. Uh, maybe you spend $200 a month on gas, depending on what kind of car you drive. And then if you, if you have insurance of some kind, um, typically that is billed quarterly or annually, but work it out to whatever it works out to per month. So in my case, I take like $6,000 a year, uh, and that's my monthly insurance cost. Let's go ahead um and and yeah. so before you go on, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, without the video, then you can see what Chris is doing. If you go to trustinsights.ai slash YouTube, where you can see the corresponding video. Um, so what Chris has up on his screen right now is a very simple spreadsheet. He's putting together his own personal budget plan so that he knows how much money is going out the door month over month for himself personally. Exactly. And this is fictional. This is not actually what Right, I mean. of course. Um, <clears throat> so what we've got here, and you, you, you're you going to want to look at your credit card statements, your bank statements, all this stuff to figure out what you spend every month on everything and anything. Uh, in this case, the, the number here is $4,250 a month. Now we're going to add in a 10% emergency and take that number times 1.1. So your target uh, after taxes is $4,675 a month. So annual salary after taxes equals this, the four, 4625 times 12. So you need to be clearing after taxes, Social Security, blah, 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 $56,100 a month. The way to figure out what that is before taxes is to figure out, A, what your tax bracket is. Uh, this is mostly for the United States, but obviously it applies to, to anyone. <clears throat> so you have your federal tax and you have your state tax. Uh, the Massachusetts state income tax for where we live is 6%. <clears throat> so it equals this times uh, 0 0.06. And then your federal tax bracket, um, generally speaking, most people I think are going to be in the 24 20 to 25%. So it equals this times uh, 0.25. So I'm multiplying the, the, at, the taxes afterwards um, times those numbers. And we're going to add those all together. And your target salary is going to be your 56,100, which is your 
uh, target after taxes plus your taxes. So you're for so in this example person here, the money that you should be trying to aim for should be at least seventy three thousand four hundred ninety one dollars. So call it seventy five thousand dollars for short. That's your internal salary calculation. You want to do this exercise so that you can figure out how do I how do I know what what I should not go below, right? Mm -hmm. This is the number. Like if you go below this number, you're going to be in, incurring potential financial hardship. Whereas mm -hmm. if you stay above this number, then anything an employer offers you would be gravy on top of that. It would be like, great, I can go and, you know, maybe subscribe to Disney Plus that, you know, <laughs> that mm -hmm. month. Um, Bank board I mean, savings, start a 401k, whatever exactly. that thing is. Yeah. Pay an arm and a leg for Taylor Swift tickets, whatever the... <laughs> oh my goodness. No, thank you. <laughs> exactly. So that is the 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 internal salary and this computation again real simple your bank account statements your credit card statements whatever it is that you're spending money on just it work it out to whatever the monthly equivalent is add that all up and then add back in your taxes and it tells mm -hmm. you your target so that's the external the second step is to do the i mean that's the internal the second step is the external so this again this is something that you and john discussed on the show Mm -hmm. And that is you go to a place like salary.com or any of these these places and you say, okay, what am I worth? So let's do, say, marketing manager and let's do Boston, Massachusetts and get a salary estimate. And let's take a look at our job title here. Mm hmm Well, and this, and this is where you need to really do the research because titles – are pretty much uh, irrelevant these days. And so you need to do enough research to figure out an equivalent type job because a manager at one company is not the same as a manager at, the, at you know a company down the street. Exactly. So here we have, besides a whole bunch of ads, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> we have a, a bell curve of your, the lowest 10% uh, people in the marketing manager position in Boston make $97,958. Huh. The median is $127,972. And then the top 10% make $164,096. Hmm. Now, this makes me very angry. <laughs> Why? Well, because when I was a marketing manager, I was not making that money. And I was told I couldn't make that kind of money. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, when you look at um, jobs and salaries, the number to pay attention to is that bottom 10%. That is the number that pretty much everybody should be making that that if you're in the correct title. Hmm. Um, and that means that when we look at when we think back to our budget, right, our budget said $74,000, $75,000 a year is what we needed to make the the Bottom line, like everybody who's in this job, whether or not they're actually good at it, um, is ninety seven thousand. So in this case, we've got a pretty good match, right? We've we've got you can walk in there with some level of confidence and say, yeah, I no matter what happens, as long as I get the job, I'm going to be making enough to to cover my fees, to cover my expenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I it's you as the job seeker. It is your responsibility to be to come with this research uh the company that you're applying to is not going to do it for you they're going to hope that you aren't doing it at all and will just accept whatever they offer you um which to be quite honest has was the position that i was in it was not something that i didn't know things like salary.com existed um i didn't know i was never taught or told that it was okay to negotiate the salary that they were offering you um, and so those are the things that were detrimental to my career that looking back, those are, you know, tips and tricks and tactics that I wish I had known. Exactly. Now, the other thing that tools like this give you is like, you give you a sense of you know, what's, what's the potential bonus structure look like. Um, so people who are in that position, uh, we see the, the bottom 10% with bonuses can get to a hundred, two thousand $2,000. So they can get to the six figures. Um, with bonuses, um, the the top ten percent can with bonuses can get to up to one hundred eighty three thousand dollars. Now, hmm. this is Boston. This is today. This is based on uh, the panel of of folks that they've asked. You can also look at the benefits to say, okay, what are the things that uh, your core compensation, and then all of the other stuff like healthcare, for example. Um, 
if someone is offering you 100% healthcare, then that you know, is worth, you know, tens of thousands of dollars sometimes, depending on the, the, the location and the, the, the regulations in your area. So that may be something you have to factor into um, uh, your costs, uh, uh, what you're able to ask for. So that's the external salary. So you have internal salary, external salary. And the, the way to think about this, that is your internal salary number, you can't go below that. That is, mm-hmm. that is non-negotiable to you. Your external salary is how much could you get if you position yourself as a great candidate? And then the difference is the negotiating zone to say like, okay, you know, Katie, we've got this marketing manager position open, but we're a crappy agency that can't, aff- that, that routinely underpays people because we know they're going to the last nine months. Anyway, um, would you, would you consider this job for $85,000? And if you have that mental number in your head of, you know, I need to make 75, they're like, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe you can extract some more concessions. I want four weeks of time off instead of two. Mm-hmm. Um, I want a hundred percent healthcare instead of eighty percent. Um, uh, I want uh, vesting of my options at an accelerated rate. Uh, you 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 can make that up. But if I said, Katie, can you do this job for seventy thousand dollars? The answer would be no. Like, nope, mm-hmm. can't do that. Now, here's the you know, data aside. Negotiating salary in a job interview can be a very intimidating thing. And not everyone is comfortable being that direct and blunt, especially if you're in a position where you really need a job and you've been looking for a long time. And so, you know, I feel like depending on your personality, probably even depending on your gender and your uh, background, it's going to be more Mm. tricky to feel comfortable speaking up. I know... I can only speak to my experience, but as a woman with primarily male uh, hiring managers, I felt very uncomfortable having those conversations because they would get shut down immediately. And so, Chris, what's your advice or how have you navigated that? So unsurprisingly, the answer I will go with is a a certain amount of data. Um, There are uh, websites out there that can give you a sense of what the market is like. So this is an example. This is the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, FRED. Um, and we are looking at, in this case, the m- number of marketing job postings on Indeed.com in the US since February of 2020. That's the zero line. If you were applying for a job in, say, May of 2020, there are 53% fewer marketing jobs. The chances of you getting a job are pretty low, right? The, the people just aren't hiring. And so you might have to say, yeah, you know what? I'm going to take whatever I can get because things suck. Um, there's the, the, the economy is just not there. If you're applying for a job in you know, February of 2022, there's 84% more openings than there were. And so the, the balance of power is in the favor of the job seeker and not the employer. And so data like this gives you a sense going right in, what's the balance of power? Is is the market in favor of the employer or is the market in favor of the candidate? If the marketer is in favor of the candidate, you know that you can be a little bit more bold. You can say like, yeah, I know that you're stuck. Like you can't hire. Um, You can even do things like look at um, sites like uh, archive.org, which is the the internet archive and see how long that job posting has been up there. It's kind of like with real estate, you know, like, Hey, this house has been on the market for 541 days you know, you're going to give me a break on price because you're clearly not able to sell it. There's something wrong that, you know, in a, in a hot housing market, this house is not moving. <clears throat> on the other hand, if the house is, uh, you know, on the market for two days and there's five bids, like, all right, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you whatever I can, uh, whatever I can, because I, I need this and, and it's not, you know, it's not there. So you're right. It's a balance of what do you need as a person? Like, do you need a job today? Um, or can you afford to, to wait? And it's a, a balance of the employer. Like, do you know that this employer is in dire straits and and they are trying to put butts in seats? Like, hey, I just fired half the company. Oh, wait, we need those people. Um, can you come back? At that point, you can be like, so I was working for $100,000. Now you're going to pay me 150 because I'm the only one who knows how your systems operate and, and, uh, and you need me. And from a, a confidence perspective, having that information up front before, you know, like you said, doing your research really helps set the tone in your own head of like, I know what I'm walking into. Mm-hmm. No, and I think that that's, that's really important because without 
that at least those talking points, those research points, it's hard to find that confidence to be, I mean, Chris, the, I, to be fair, the way you're describing it is very aggressive. Um, and, you know, you do need to stand up for yourself in those job interviews. It's not easy for everyone to do that. I know myself at 22 years old, when I was looking for a full-time job, did not have that confidence. And I bungled a lot of job interviews and also had a lot of really terrible interviews with terrible people. But I was just so grateful that they were even interviewing me, my goodness. And so I think, you know, the advice for someone who's looking for a job, who's looking to negotiate salary is, at the very least, have all of those talking points, you know, well, according to salary.com, you know, who interviews, you know, such and such people, you know, the salary range for this role, my understanding is this, but it sounds like you're offering me less than that. Is there a way that we could meet? So, you know, there's ways to have those conversations that is still to your benefit. And you're just, you know, sharing the information, sort of removing emotion from it, because job interviews can be very emotional, because, you know, this is your future, maybe you're interviewing for your dream job, but the hiring manager is a complete dick. And that's going to ruin the experience for you. So, having all of that information to go in with is going to make it easier for you to stay focused. Like, so for example, when I get, um, you know, overwhelmed or I'm starting to feel very emotional about something, I have a hard time focusing on what the person is saying to me. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of the reasons why when, you know, faced with a big decision or, you know, I have to respond to something, I take some time, I take a day or two, you know, to really collect my thoughts, but you don't necessarily have that opportunity in a job interview. It's a lot of right then and there, taking in a lot of information that can be overwhelming and trying to respond to it. And so having those data points to help keep you focused will help to sort of lessen the amount of overwhelming information that's coming at you. Exactly. And the other thing to keep in mind, well, there's two other things to keep in mind. Uh, Kat Kibben, Kat, Katrina Kibben was the person that uh, spoke at SNPS and I go follow them on, on LinkedIn stuff. They're, they're a fascinating person and have a lot of really good insights on hiring. But one thing to keep in mind is we don't interview a whole lot, right? In our careers, maybe we interview five, 10 times, you know, um, for, for jobs. Uh, it's not a, it's not something we do on a regular or frequent basis, which means that we don't really have an opportunity to practice. So the number one thing that you can do to become more comfortable with interviewing is interviewing. Uh, mm -hmm. Ask some of your friends to play that role. Do the role playing. If you have a mentor, if you have a professional network, if you have a place um, like our free Slack community, Analytics for Marketers, um, Ask somebody, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I just need to practice my interviewing skills. Would somebody mm -hmm. be willing to be an aggressive interviewer, a, a confrontational interviewer? The, whatever you know from your past, like, I know I'm really bad in this situation. Mm -hmm. Can, is there somebody who would volunteer to play the bad cop role so that I get practice handling that? I would love to do that for anyone who needs that. So, you know, join our analytics for marketers free Slack group and, let me know if you want to have that kind of practice. I'm happy to do that. Exactly. If you want a terrible interview, ask me. I'll, I'll be more than happy <laughs> to give you a, a really awkward interview. Um, so that's part one. Mm -hmm. Part two is, and this is something that, that Kat was saying last week at, at the event, is when it comes down to qualifications, most employers are lying most of the time. And you can, <laughs> and you can be very specific in your questions, and that can um, change the balance of power in the interview. For example, mm -hmm. Um, you might say uh, you need to have six years experience uh, for this job, right? Um, and the question, and this is Kat's example, the question you can ask is, can you tell me specifically, what does somebody who has six years of experience know that somebody with four years of experience doesn't know? Hmm. And if the employer is like, uh, I don't know. And then you're like, okay, well then maybe that requirement's not necessarily all that important. Has you know a, a bachelor's degree in communications. What does somebody who has a bachelor's degree in communications know that somebody who has three years of work experience, but no degree wouldn't know. And again, if the answer is, I don't really know, then you can start picking apart those requirements. So if you see a position that you like, that, uh, but you know, there's these things that seem like obstacles, go for it anyway with those specific questions in mind to say, okay, okay let's, let's pick this apart. You know, um, must know Adobe Photoshop. How often, how, is Photoshop something we do in this role every day? 
Like, it, it, how important is that requirement actually? Uh, and if the answer is, um, uh, actually, nobody uses Photoshop here. We just copied and pasted that from the last job description. Like, oh, okay. So it's, let's draw a red line through that. We don't really need that. Um, being specific. This is something Andy Crestodina says. Specificity correlates with conversion, but it also means that when you're interviewing, the more specific you are, A, it shows that you're really dialed into the position, and B, it pushes back on a lot of the probably bogus requirements that are in a job. Mm hmm well, and, you know, that's something, it's advice that I always give to people who are asking for it is, even if you don't meet all of the qualifications in a job posting, that doesn't mean you shouldn't apply. Um, because those are, you know, definitely just talking points to go through during the interview. So, you know, to your point, Chris, well, you know, I have all of the other qualifications, but I don't have 12 years of experience doing it. Could I still do the job? Probably. Because mm -hmm. what does 12 years get you versus six years? Um, just more time doing the same thing. Um, you know, so it's definitely good to bring those questions into the interview of, you know, so I noted here that you wanted someone who had two years of PR experience. Well, I only have one year, but let me tell you what I was able to do in learn in that one year. And so presenting yourself, you know, as accomplished versus being like, oh, well, I don't have the experience. I can't do the thing. You can do the thing. You absolutely can. Exactly. And those specific questions, again, like exactly what you're saying, Katie, uh, open up the door for you to talk about your experiences. Say, mm -hmm. So you're asking for 12 years experience. What does that person do know that a person with nine years experience doesn't be able to do that? The, the boss is like, um, well, well, maybe they lead larger teams. Really? How large a team? Uh, 20 people. Let me tell you about the time I managed a 20 person team at my last position. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so you can you can take the teeth out of those requirements uh, and say like, here's, here's how I do exactly what you're asking for, mm -hmm. but it doesn't look like it on paper, but I'm a better fit for you than you know, some person who has 12 years of experience, but maybe never actually managed a team of 20. Right. Well, and you know, if we bring it back to our own personal experience, when I was hired, Chris, to run your marketing tech team, I had zero experience in marketing technology, which was one of the requirements on the job description was that you had like three to five years of experience in that. And I had zero to zero years of experience in it. And yet somehow I managed to make the team pretty successful in less than those three to five years of experience that was required. And in that example, the questions to ask were, okay, what does the knowing of marketing technology have to do with the problem that you're facing, which is you have a team that is being badly managed, right? Mm -hmm. Because the real skill that was needed is not marketing technology. The real skill was, can you herd these cats? <laughs> right. And that was something that I could confidently speak to. And now and I was able to learn marketing technology and I'm still learning marketing technology as I go, but that's not where my expertise was most needed. And so that, in that situation worked out to my benefit and your benefit that it didn't matter if I knew a CPA from a CPC from a CPMA. I'll be honest, those things still confuse me, but that's not where my uh, skill set is needed. You absolutely don't need me to be an expert in those things. Exactly. And so what this has to do with the question of salary is that when we go back to this chart, um, if we say that a person who barely knows stuff meets the minimum requirements would get that that 10 percent you know be, uh, be on the left hand side of that that bell curve mm -hmm. if you're able to say well let me talk let's talk through these requirements let's let's be more specific every single requirement that you can knock down with your specific experience moves you a little further on the right of this bell curve you can say well you know it, how critical is team management oh it's the most important thing Great, I can do that. Let's talk about a salary that's maybe closer towards the middle. How important mm -hmm. is re team retention? Oh, we, you know, we, we're churning people like crazy. We can't keep someone more than six months. Great, let me tell you about my three retention strategies, and let's maybe talk about a salary that's closer to that seventy-five percent line because these are the things you have said are, mm -hmm. are mission critical. I can do those things for you, yep. um, and and you can get to those higher salaries. So. You have your internal requirements, 
This is, mm-hmm. you, you must get this number or else you're in financial trouble. And I would very strongly encourage you to always add that 10% buffer um, on top of any other savings you're doing because stuff happens in life. Mm-hmm. And then with the external uh, salary requirements, look at the data, look at the requirements, look at what you can actually do and be prepared to talk to people and say, let's, let's be very specific about what you're requiring for this job. What's really your, the problem? Because mm-hmm. interviewing for a job, it's a sales job. You're, you're, you are the salesperson. The product you're selling is you. Mm-hmm. You would not accept uh, a salesperson. Like, so, I mean, the product's okay. I mean, I mm-hmm. guess, right? Like, no, no. Let's talk about how this product will solve your problem, right? This, this software will make your life easier, will make you more money, will, will cover your butt from your boss. Mm-hmm. That same approach can help you move that salary needle from the left-hand side of that bell curve to the right-hand side. And I think, Chris, your advice about running through dry runs of practice interviews is going to be critical, um, especially as, you know, the hiring process. I mean, the last time you and I went through it was many, many moons ago, and it's probably changed a lot. And there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And so the more prepared you are as an applicant, the more comfortable you feel in those uncertain situations the better off you're going to be. So definitely find a friend, find a colleague, you know, find someone in our analytics for marketers Slack group who's willing to play the role of that, you know, squirrely uncertain hiring manager who's going to throw curveballs at you and give you the space in that safety to practice what you would say and do it as much as you need to in order so that it just feels like muscle memory at that point. And then you can focus on what's really important, which is, getting the job and getting, you know, the salary that you deserve. Exactly right. Um, maybe we'll do another follow-up show on, on some of the personal branding stuff, because, you know, as you were saying that, like, yeah, I've, the last job I interviewed for was in 2012. Um, so about 10 years ago now. Um, but the last time I even used a resume, it was 2003. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the, the personal branding stuff. I think so maybe we'll, ta- we'll, we'll add that for a follow-up show. Cause I think that could be pretty helpful for some folks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can absolutely do that. Um, but I think the bottom line is do your research, make sure you know what your position is valued at, make sure you know what you're valued at and get some practice in. Make sure that you can walk into an interview confident that you've explored all the different scenarios that are going to be thrown at you from, you know, an interviewer who leaves the room halfway through, doesn't say anything to get themselves some coffee and not come back for 10 minutes. So you're not sure what's happening. And yet somehow you still manage to get the job to a hiring manager who is on their game and gives you all of the information. And that in and of itself can be jarring because you weren't expecting it. Exactly. And if you want to share your own interviewing tips and your own salary negotiation tips, feel free to pop on over to the free Slack group. Go to trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers, where you and almost 3,000 other marketers are asking and answering each other's questions every single day. And wherever it is that you watch or listen to the show, if there's a platform you'd rather have it on, go to trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast, where you can find our show in, in all these different formats. And if uh, you're there, please give it a thumbs up or a rating or a review. It does help share the show. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time.